The following program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters. Welcome to Common Sense Living, the stepping stone to success. Common Sense Living, where common sense makes perfect sense. Think of Walt Disney. He didn't quit. That's common sense. Like Abraham Lincoln, turn your negatives into positives and your chaos into order. Patience, persistence, perspiration make an unbeatable combination for success. Welcome to Common Sense Living, where common sense makes perfect sense. Welcome to Common Sense Living, where common sense makes perfect sense. This is your host, Jose Luna, in Common Sense Living, and with me, Brian Young. We missed you, Brian. I know you have been really, really busy, but, you know, we missed you. Thank you, Jose. We had a beautiful day, and I figured I'd out, uh, go outside and enjoy some of that nice spring weather. I know, I know. You're, you're an outdoor guy. You like to be outdoors all the time. That's good. I'm more like an indoor guy, you know, exactly the opposite. I like to be outdoor, but... Uh, only if it's warm. Only if it's warm, exactly. Now we are talking business. We're on the same page. <laughs> well, today, my friends, in Common Sense Living, we are going to continue to talk about, you know, some assumptions that people have about the Bible and, uh, and about that book uh, that is considered sacred by Christians. And uh, today we want to put to you uh, some numbers about how people really perceive the scriptures, the, the Holy Bible, the Bible that Christians used. Every major religion has a, uh, a sacred writings, you know, the Bhagavad Gita, the Muslims have the, the Quran, Christians have the Bible, and the Jewish people have the Torah and the Kabbalah that goes also with the tradition. They have also the Talmud and the Tanakh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But Christians, we have the Bible. And, and um, there's a lot of misconceptions about the Bible. So I want to sh uh, share with you some numbers about, about, you know, how people really view the Bible. And I don't know, before I present that to you, uh, my dear friends, I want to ask Brian, Brian, before you came to know the Lord, how did you view the Bible? yourself well i mean i looked at the bible for whatever it was and here it is it's a book uh it was a collection of stories uh that were passed down from generation to generation you know given to us and we're supposed to follow them you know that's what i that's basically what i looked you know and people said it's the word of god and you know and i looked at it, it's kind of like more of a history book yeah this is how i kind of viewed it well, let me tell you that the, the first, uh, our first slide on the PowerPoint uh, says that one third of the American adult population believes the Bible is the actual word of God, which means word by word. But I, I'm going to caution you about this word by word. When this uh, interview or interviews were done or, or polls were, were done about the Bible, this is based on the idea that the Bible was dictated, not inspired, okay? So when, when this poll presents that this number, one-third of the American population, which means 33% about, right? 30, yeah, between absolutely. 30 and 35% of the American population believe that the Bible is the Word of God and is inspired, and, but word by word, when they say word by word, they mean dictated, which means inerrant. There, is, there are no errors in the Bible. And we are going to see that the Bible was not dictated. It was inspired, which is different. So look at, look at these numbers, Brian. Look at these numbers. One in five Americans, one in five Americans believe that the Bible, as you used to, is an ancient book filled with fables, 
folk tales and history, moral precepts that are good for people, but it's not, it doesn't have any authority uh, it, uh, built in it. So what do you think about that? Well, I mean, it's, uh, that's what I used to believe. I mean, it's, uh, I, I was the person there, you know, I was trying to learn about it and I got taught this is the, you know, the word of God and this is our recorded history back into uh, the beginning of time. Now, it says that this uh, one, f one in five Americans believe these are moral precepts recorded by men or written by men. You know, I would agree to that. Yeah, it was written by men. It was written by men. I mean, make no mistakes. The Bible, the Bible was written by men. We're not trying to deny that. Of course it was written by men. In fact, it was written by broken people. Most of them, with a lot of issues. Oh, if, you yeah. think, if you think about it, Moses, he was a murderer. Paul was a terrorist. Paul, Apostle Paul, he was a terrorist. You know? And then we have Solomon. <laughs> he was a polygamist. So you find all these type of personalities in the Bible. Noah was a drunkard. Rahab was a prostitute. You know, and, but all these people made their way into the scriptures. And that's, what, that's the beauty. Because the Bible is not trying to sugarcoat things. It's not trying to put people in a perspective that, like, like a sainthood perspective. No. You know, people who make mistakes and God still used them. Yeah, so I have hope. I, I have hope. I have hope. Lord, I've made mistakes. Oh, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> so, look at this. Those in the East are least likely to believe in a literal Bible. Those in the East. Why is that? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, I think... Uh, I mean, the East of the United States, which means New England. Right. I mean, it, it, my history uh, growing up in New England... We are more of a stoic, uh, rigid bunch. Uh, we're very set in our customs. Uh, we're set in our ways for a, a lot of things. And, you know, things we, we do things the way that we're told and the way that they are. That's the way we have to do it. And, you know, you kind of follow it without question. It's passed down from your parents. I can, I, you know, I, I, see, I, see, I see your point. But look at it also from this perspective. New Hampshire has a literacy rate. 96.7%. That's a high literacy rate. Yeah, well, I mean, we, we think we're smarter than what we are, is what it is. <laughs> That's, a, you know, we're very The question I have is... We're rugged New Englanders. <laughs> is there a correlation between this concept of high education and disregard for the Bible? Well, I what's, think what's your view? I don't know. I, I'd like to say yes, because it seems the... More education, I've got a lot of friends that are very educated, and the more education they get, and the more that they believe in science. Um, rather than the Bible. Rather than the Bible. They believe in science, and they trust in mathematics, which, again, I was a very rigid thinker like that also. Uh, it, it makes sense. It's very orderly, and there's nothing. It's factual, it, it's science. It's, it's very factual. I mean, and it's, it's something you can reach out, and the concepts, you can touch them, you can see them. And they're very easy. You can see the proof of them, and it's in your face. It's real. Um, whereas the Bible and the concepts and the precepts behind and within the Bible, it's not really real. Where you can't reach out and touch it, and you can't. It's something you know, that needs to be experienced you, you, rather you than. You do need to experience it. Yeah, right. yeah. I mean, you, that's why they call it faith. I mean, you need to have a little bit of faith. You need to have a little bit of belief in the system. Um, they definitely believe, but the, the more that they're educated, the, the more they know. Uh, and again, they seem to think that they know almost everything because then the more they know, the more they turn from uh, an agnostic point of view, whereas, you know, I'm kind of ignorant, to an atheist view where I know it's not true. Right. So the more they rely on science, the more they turn towards the, you know, there is no existence The other of side of the spectrum. Yeah, so, but I don't want the... Which is contrary to what their actual beliefs are. It's the best part about it. Right. But I don't want our viewers to get the, this, even the slight idea that we are saying that in order for you to believe in the Bible, 
it's better for you not to have a good education or not to be well educated. But because that's not the point, that's not why I brought this particular part of the statistics. I think uh, what I'm trying to say is basically is that perhaps that we, as you just pointed out very beautifully, I, I don't know if I could really recap the whole thing, but is that we start to rely more on ourselves in our education rather in something that we can we consider factual that we can touch and cre recreate and redo rather than something that is more intangible something that is more invisible like the invisible god something intangible like faith you know that type of thing is easier well we tend to be very self-reliant we're rugged when we want to be able to depend on I, growing up, I wanted to depend on nobody but myself. I wanted to, I, I know what I know, and, I, and these are the things that I can do, and then if I don't know or I can't do it, I certainly can learn it. But do you, do you think that people out there be, really believe that if you read the Bible, and if you, if you believe in the Bible, uh, it means that you are becoming dependent on somebody? To, the, the, to, to a certain I, I'm extent. I'm asking because I have never been in that position. Uh, to a certain extent. I also, I know that I've got a lot of friends uh, that they consider, you know, you read in the Bible, you believe in God. They basically just consider that you're stupid. Right. You know, because... It, it is what it is. It is what it is. You know, how could you possibly do that? These are all the facts that are staring you in the face. I mean, they look at what the facts are and it's not a tangible, um, it, it kind of reminds me of the old Greek mindset. Greeks were very rigid. High in philosophy. They had, there was no abstract, no ability to form an abstract thought. So, you know, to take something as abstract as, you know, God and Jesus Christ could possibly have been, you know, God on earth, you can, they can't take that concept and wrap their brain around it because they're very rigid, everything needs to fall in order, and it needs to be, I mean, it has to be in place. And they have a difficult time breaking away from that sense of order that mathematics and science brings. Right, now, l listen to these statistics. 92% of American people own at least one Bible. 92%? 92%. 92 in the households of Americans, there is at least one Bible. And today, when you go to church, well, those that can open their Bibles or their iPads or their iPhones, uh, please join me in this book, so and so and so. Right. But 92%, that's a high percentage. However, in my experience as someone coming from the outside to teach Bible to people here, what I find is there is a major illiteracy. There is a, a, a lot of people are illiterate when it comes to the Bible. You know, I, I work with kids as well and, you know, and, and families and, and a great percentage of people have never, never read the Bible. Well, that's, and that's, that's concerning. It, it is. And, and part of the thing is we're all taught as young children you know, we learn the different Bible lessons. You learn the story of Moses. You learn the story of Joseph. You know, you learn the story of Jesus. And, you know, yada, yada, yada along the whole way. There's the certain ones that we all learn because uh, it was the pass down, you know, word of mouth. Mm -hmm. You know, those of us, as we get older, we can tend to delve in. The Bible isn't like any other book. You cannot pick up the Bible, start in chapter one, page one, column one, paragraph one, and read it, take notes in it, and continue on to page two, page three, all the way to page two. I don't see why not. Well, to 1600, it's very difficult in order to do that and really retain that information unless you really focus on it. Because there's so much information in the Bible and you really need but a lot of cross-referencing. I, I, I hear you. It, I it's, hear. it's not you, a regular textbook today. You know, you go to the school system, pick up a textbook. I can pick up a textbook, open up a chapter that's on a specific subject. It's very detailed and organized, and it's, it's laid out in a certain manner as conducive to learning the material specifically there. Now, the Bible itself is, but it's not very plain to a lot of people 
because of the way the Bible was written. The Bible isn't meant to be taken well, literally word for word. Well, let me let me That's the let difference. me let me uh, let me speak to that a little bit. Um, the way it was written, I think, is not necessarily the way, well. It has to do a lot with the way it was written, but it's not everything. I think it has to do a lot with um, the the mindset. Uh, for example, uh, let's say in America, in America. Uh, we are talking here, we are developing an argument. At the end, we're going to do a summary. So y that's our mindset. That's the Western mentality. Our mindset is you go inductively. You bring people slowly to a point, bring it to a climax, and then you develop the whole concept because it has been already given in small parts. The Bible is written exactly the opposite. It's on the opposite. Exactly the opposite. It gives you the end in the very beginning. And then it tells you, it breaks it down in parts, how it got there. And sometimes when people are trying to read the Bible that, you know, with Western mindset, is, uh, they, 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 they encounter a wall. But, but, you know, I tell my kids a lot of the times, you know, when I tell them stories, like last Sunday, I was um, hold, uh, holding the service, I was preaching the service for the kids, and, um, and I told them the story about this guy called Abimelech, who had 70 brothers, and his father died. Of course, the father had several uh, wives, and uh, he went to the elders of town and town hall, and he told them, do you want to have 71 kings or you want to have just one king? You need to choose. If you choose to have one king, I'm willing to do it, and my brothers are going to back me up. Because he was very ambitious. And the, the guy, um, you know, they said, you are going to be the leader. You, you are smart. You know what you're doing. So they made him leader. And the brothers came and gave each one from their inheritance, gave them um, one third of their inheritance to this, to this brother, which made him richer than all the other siblings. Combined. Combined. All right? So now all of a sudden the guy has power, unlimited power. He has wealth, pretty much almost unlimited. And he has influence. The first thing he did, he goes and hire a band of gang members. And he hires these gang members to be his bodyguards, to protect him. And then what he does, he invites his brothers to come to a party. And when they come to a party, he tells his bodyguards to kill them one by one. And he kills 69 of the 70 brothers. One escape. So, and I told the kids, did you ever realize that the Bible speaks and tells that kind of stories? No, never. Wow. So, you see, because sometimes we spiritualize the Bible a lot. And when we spiritualize the Bible a lot, we don't see the human nature in the characters portrayed in the story or in the stories. And I think that we have somehow to find a way to look into the Bible, not as a book like, oh, I'm becoming a spiritual or whatever. If you wish, just read the Bible. Just read it just for the sake of learning about human nature because it's going <laughs> to tell you things the way they are. Right. I mean, the, the difficult part of getting down and reading the Bible, when you get down... And you go to try to read it, you're expecting to get something out of it. And right. that's the thing. Uh, and that's a big problem that I've always had with it. Like going in, I, I'm expecting to go in and I need to get something out of the Bible. And when you actually stop and just read it for what it is, you know, when you try to tackle, and one of the biggest problems I made was I tried tackling the Bible, you know, word for word, cover to cover, sit down, because that's how you read a book. And it was, it was a monstrous undertaking, and it, it probably took me years to do it. And I've forgotten 90% of it. Even though, literally, you can take the Bible and read it cover to cover in 46 hours. And I mean, an, a, an average reader. Right. An average reader. And the thing is, though, just because there's just so much, and it, to me, it was, it was everything was jumbled around. 
and I was trying to get something out of it, and again, looking for more than what was there um, in other parts, and again, I should have just read it for what it was. Right. You know, so it was, it was just a very difficult thing to do. And I find a lot of people have had the very similar circumstances. It's not structured in a way that's conducive to how I learned on how to read and how to study something. So remember, remember, if you are going to read the Bible, remember always, always in the Bible, the end of the story is always in the beginning. Always. The, the summary is always in the beginning. Another example. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The first words. It doesn't tell us much, but that's the end. God created everything. Right. And then he tells you, on day one, he did this. On day two, he did this. On day three, day four, day five, day six, day seven. So he breaks it down exactly how, what he did. And then in chapter two, he breaks it down how he did it. Right? So, and that's very, very Hebrew. It's, uh, it's, it's the, the Hebrew people were the kings of the ancient prose. They, they, were, they were the master storytellers of all the other ancient people. Anyway, but, you know, uh, something else that I want to share with you is that the average, the average number of Bibles in households is three. And this includes not only the homes of practicing Christians, but hundreds of thousands of atheists as well. So what we know is that most atheists and agnostics, they already read the Bible. Oh, they've read some portion of it, absolutely. Yeah, so it's very fascinating. In a poll taken by the Gallup organization in the October 2000, 59% of Americans reported that they read the Bible at least occasionally. And this is down from 73% in the 1980s. So we are going down the hill. People are reading the Bible less and less and less. And I, I wonder, I wonder because if you think about it, in the 1800s, uh, 1798, came the French Revolution. So democracy was basically, uh, you know, started to preach to the rest of the world. And, um, and, and then in 1800 came the first Bible, the British, the London Bible Society was formed in England. And they started to print Bibles to give to the whole world. The same year, 1800, the Industrial Revolution. The fascinating thing is for 1,260 years, the people did not have access to the Bible we had the dark ages. Yeah. <laughs> so is there a correlation between reading the Bible and having prosperity? So now we this is what I'm this is what I'm saying. Now we are seeing a decline in morality. More violence, more drugs, more problems, more issues. And it's interesting, less people are reading the Bible. I mean, it's also an interesting concept on that. It's uh as a, a people, with the advent of, you know, technology, we're getting lazier and lazier. I you know. know. <laughs> uh, if you remember, you go back to the... the smartphones are making people oh, dumb yeah, well, you go you go back to the 80s. I mean, I remember in the 80s, I was, uh, you know, a young boy growing up, you know, watching television. You know, we had three channels on television, and then you had the several UHF channels. Then we got cable. You know, that added six or seven channels to the lineup. Now there's hundreds, hundreds if not of thousands channels. of channels. Yeah. Um, in addition to that, to you know, the internet, there, there's the social media. Hundreds and thousands of radio stations. And now there's the internet. You know, in addition to all the newsprint, and there's so much media out there. You know, a lot of times I can go into my bedroom, I can pick up my smartphone, hit a button. And I can have any book in the world read to me, or I can listen to a video, or I can listen to the radio of having somebody else Just, read, or having somebody else speak to me, or I can, you know, go in front of the television and I can watch the video, having somebody teach to me. We're, we're lazy. We don't want to do it ourselves. I mean, we've become conditioned over the last 30 years to have everybody do things for us instead of getting down and doing it ourselves. I know, I know. You, you are right on target. 
listen to this one. Listen to this one that is on the screen uh, for you. Uh, only half, which means two in four adults can name, you know, um, they were interviewed nationwide. They could name any of the four Gospels of the New Testament. That's pathetic. That's, that's bad. Because there are only four Gospels, right? Look at this one. Just 37% of those interviewed could name all four Gospels. Only 37%. And 12% of adults believe that Noah's wife was Joan of Arc. Well, he did build the Ark. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a good thing that they I made mean, it. I mean, uh, but it's... You know, and I, am, I using, am I using the right word? I, I want to know that 12% of the people, if they watched the movie Joan of Arc that they made... <laughs> Oh, man. Uh, listen to this one. 49% of the people believe that the Bible teaches that money is the root of all evil. Almost 50% of people believe that the Bible teaches that. And the Bible doesn't teach that. It's the love for money, the root of all types of evil, not money in itself. So, t tell me about it. We, we need to wrap this up. But, you know, it's fascinating for me that... To, to see all these conceptions, all misconceptions of people about the Bible. And, and I keep pounding, pounding, uh, and, and I want to make this clear, and I, and I want to keep pounding this concept. You don't have to be afraid of the Bible. You don't have to be afraid of this book. This book has never done any damage or hurt anyone, the reading of the book. It is the, what has done damage and hurt people has been the interpretation of some individuals, religious people, right, that have taken some interpretations of the Bible, that things that have made, um, may have been given to us in a description, and they have made a prescription. And two different things. And if we need to be very careful not to make of a descri description a prescription. And I think that's where the main problem lies because people, when they read the Bible, they don't get it because they are reading something that's been described and then they try to apply it exactly, literally the way he says it. Well, and the other half of it, the other part of it is, you know, people don't read it. People don't read it. They, people they, don't they read it. They take misinformation from other people and they say, okay, well, that's what he told me about what it says, so that's what it is. And then they go, well, that's no good because... And they don't get down and get the information themselves. Right. Well, we have come to the end of Common Sense Living. And we want to thank you for uh, being out there watching and uh, participating with us in this program. Back to the basics about the reliability of the Bible and why we shouldn't be afraid of it. But thank you so much for being with us in this Common Sense Living, where common sense makes perfect sense. Welcome to Common Sense Living, the stepping stone to success. Common Sense Living, where common sense makes perfect sense. Think of Walt Disney. He didn't quit. That's common sense. Like Abraham Lincoln, turn your negatives into positives and your chaos into order. Patience, persistence, Perspiration, make an unbeatable combination for success. Welcome to Common Sense Living, where common sense makes perfect sense.